you. It's just my, my core fan shit. It's good. It's good. <laughs> Can they give a donation on the way out? That's too much to ask. But they should carry on with the show. <laughs> That's a record for me. I just said that that quick, but I've entered a room. You know? Okay, so. They missed a moose, that's the best one. Oh, well. I shot a moose once. I was hunting, upstate New York, and I shot a moose. And I strap him onto the fender of my car. And I'm driving home. But what I didn't realize was that the bullet did not penetrate the moose. It just creased his scalp, knocking him unconscious. And I'm driving through the Harlem Tunnel. And the moose woke up. So I'm driving with a live moose on my back. And the moose is signaling for a turn, you know. And there's a law in New York State against driving with a conscious moose on its end. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. But I don't know what to do, you know. I'm very panicky. And then it hits me. Some friends of mine are having a car. Park. I'll go. I'll take the moose. I'll ditch him at the party. It wouldn't be my responsibility. So I drive up to the party and I knock on the door. The moose is next to me. My host comes to the door. I say, hello. You know the Solomons. <laughs> we enter. The moose mingles. <laughs> Did very well. Scored. Some guy was trying to sell him insurance for an hour and a half. Well, 12 o'clock comes. They give out prizes for the best costume of the night. First prize goes to the Berkowitzes, a married couple dressed as a moose. The moose comes in second. The moose is furious. He and the Berkowitzes lock antlers in the living room. They knock each other unconscious. Now I figure here's my chance. I grab the moose, strap him on my car, and shoot back to the woods. But I've got the Berkowitzes. <laughs> so I'm driving along with two Jewish people on my fender. And there's a law in New York State. Tuesdays, Thursdays, especially Saturday. The following morning, the Berkowitzes wake up in the woods in a moose suit. Mr. Berkowitz is shot, stuffed and mounted at the New York Athletic Club. And the joke is on them, because they don't allow Jews. <laughs> you, uh, thank you. You uh, may have noticed. I escape always into a uh, rich fantasy life, which comes from an unhappy childhood. My parents did not want me when I was a baby. They put a live teddy bear in my crib. <laughs> you know? They did not love me either. They bronzed my baby shoes with my feet still in them. <laughs> I come from a poor family. My mother used to make me wear my cousin's hand-me-downs all the time. And she was not my size. <laughs> when I was a little boy, I was a tiny kid. I wanted a dog, desperately. But my parents couldn't get me a dog because we just didn't have the money. My father at that time was caddy at a miniature golf course in Brooklyn. So my parents got me, instead of a dog, they told me it was a dog. They got me an ant. <laughs> and I didn't know any better, you know, I thought it was a dog. I was a dumb kid. I called it Spot. I trained it, you know, thought it to heal and roll over. I even fashioned a little lead out of cotton thread and took it for walks around that neighborhood in Brooklyn. They took a while. <laughs> and I came home one night, late one night, and um, Sheldon Finkelstein tried to bully me. And he says to me, knock off, poor eyes. I have bad eyesight, and I'm very sensitive about it. When I take an eye test, the optometrist points to the letters, and he calls them out. He says, true or false. <laughs> and I look at Sheldon, and I look down. Spot was with me, and I said, kill. <laughs> Sheldon stepped on my dog. <laughs> I did, however, make friends with Sheldon many years later when we got older. 
I removed a thorn from his paw. <laughs> I was a troubled kid. I was in analysis from an early age. You should know this. I was in group analysis, actually, because my parents couldn't afford private. I was captain of the Leighton Paranoid Softball Team. <laughs> We used to play all the neurotics on Sunday morning, you know? Nail biters against the bedwetters. <laughs> and if you've never seen neurotics play softball, it's really funny. I used to steal second base and feel guilty and go back. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I would say, over disciplined when I was younger, which is really embarrassing. I had to be home 9.30, prom night. I made a reservation at the Copacabana for 5 o'clock. I took my date and we watched them set up. <laughs> the date did not go well. And I was very young, depressed about that for a long time. And I was going to uh, kill myself, actually. But as I said, I know. Uh, as I said, I was in a strict Freudian analysis. And if you kill yourself, they make you pay for the sessions you made. <laughs> I was, as a matter of fact, when I come to think of it, terrorized as an adolescent, also. I was on my way to an amateur music contest. My family is musical, you should know this. My father used to play the tuba as a young man. He tried to play the tuba. He tried to play Flight of the Bumblebees, and he blew his liver out through the horn. <laughs> and I'm on my way to the contest, and I'm walking past the pool room, and Floyd and all his friends are out. They're swiping hubcaps in Brooklyn for moving cars. <laughs> Floyd was the worst kid in the neighborhood. I loathed him. In the early 1940s, in the Roosevelt Dewey election, his parents voted for Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk past, and Floyd yells out to me, Hey, Red. I was a cocky kid. I put down my violin. I go up to him. And I said, my name is not Red. If you want me, call me by my regular name. It's Master Haywood Allen. I spent that winter in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> a team of doctors labored to remove a violin. <laughs> Lucky I wasn't playing the cello. <laughs> I showed up an hour later for music concerts. Came in second, anyhow. I won two weeks at interfaith camp, where I was sadistically beaten by boys of all races and creeds. I am not a fighter. I have bad reflexes. I was once run over by a car with a flat tire being pushed by two guys. <laughs> <laughs> I do get into uh, an amazing amount of physical encounters for some of my size. I remember years ago, I had my shoe shined against my will. <laughs> it's true. A tremendous shoe shine boy said to me, I'm shining your shoes. Yes, you are, I said. He did, I might add, give me a fantastic shine. But they were suede shoes. <laughs> so, so I decided I should go and build myself up, you know, so I could defend myself better. So I went to Vic Taddy's gym, and I went for six weeks, and I bent, and I squatted, and I lifted, but nothing happened to me at all, you know, nothing grew or anything. And I figured, this is ridiculous. Why don't I just give Vic Taddy the cash and ask him if he'll walk me home nice? <laughs> oh, I do have one more childhood recollection to share with you before we move on. It's not a happy one. You look surprised. <laughs> I came home from school one day, and my father had been fired. He was technologically unemployed. My father had worked for the same firm for 12 years, and they fired him. And they replaced him with a tiny little gadget, this big, that does everything that my father does, only it does it much better. And the depressing thing is, my mother ran out and bought one. <laughs> Listen to this. I was watching one night the uh, Ed Sullivan show. And Sullivan had a hypnotist called the Great Ronaldo. And Ronaldo got four guys out of the audience when he hypnotized them. And he said to them, you think you're a fire engine. And I'm home watching, and I get drowsy, and I fall asleep. I wake up an hour later, 
turn the set off. And suddenly I'm seized with an uncontrollable impulse to dress up in my red flannel underwear, <laughs> which I do. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror. Suddenly the phone rings. I burst out the front door and start running down Fifth Avenue fast, making a siren noise. <laughs> at 14th Street, I hit a guy at an intersection who was also wearing red flannel underwear. <laughs> We decided to work as one truck. <laughs> we start running down to the village. Suddenly, two guys in red flannel underwear pass us, running uptown. We figure they must know where the fire is. <laughs> we turn and follow. At 86th Street, a cop flags us down. Because there's four guys in red flannel underwear running up the street, you know. And he says to us, you're coming down to headquarters. Get into the and I start giggling hysterically, you know, because this jerk's trying to get a fire engine into a lousy little Chevy, you know. And down at the station house, there's hundreds of guys in red flannel underwear. <laughs> oh, I should just add, um, parenthetically, these stories are um, true. <laughs> <laughs> these things actually happen to me. You look doubtful. I don't make them up. My life, unfortunately, is a I know, series of these um, crises. For example, I was down south once, and I was invited to a uh, costuming party. And I rarely go to them. I went to one when I was younger. I went in my underwear shorts. I have varicose veins, and I went as a road map. <laughs> and I figure, what the hell, you know, it's Halloween. You know, go as a ghost. So I take a sheet off the bed, and I throw it over my head, and I go to the party. And you have to get the picture. I'm walking down the street in a deep southern town. I have a white sheet over my head. <laughs> and a car pulls up. The three guys with white sheets say, get in. <laughs> so I figure, there's guys going to the party. <laughs> and I get into the car, and I see that we're not going to the party. And I tell them. And they say, well, we have to go pick up the Grand Dragon. And all of a sudden, it hits me. Down south, white sheets, the Grand Dragon. I put two and two together, and I figure there's a guy going to the party dressed as a dragon. <laughs> all of a sudden, a big guy enters the car, and I'm sitting there between four clansmen, you know? Four big armed men. And the door's locked, and I'm petrified. And I'm trying to pass desperately as a southerner. I'm saying you all and grits. I must have said grits 50 times, you know? And ask me a question, I'd say, oh, grits, grits. <laughs> and next to me is the leader of the clan. You can tell he's the leader, because he's the one wearing pure cotton sheets. <laughs> and they drive me to an empty field, and I keep myself away. Because they ask for donations. And everybody there gave yeah, cash. So, yeah. But when it came to me, I said, I pledge $50. You know, I knew immediately. And they took my hood off, and they threw a rope around my neck, and they decided to hang me. And suddenly, my whole life passed before my eyes. I saw myself as a kid again in Kansas, going to school and swimming at the swimming hole, and fishing, and frying up a mess of catfish. Going down to the general store, getting a piece of gingham for Emmy Lou. <laughs> and I realized, it's not my life. <laughs> They're gonna hang me in two minutes. The wrong life is passing before my eyes. <laughs> you know? And I spoke to them. I was really eloquent. I said, fellas, this country cannot survive unless we love one another, regardless of race, creed, or color. And they were so moved by my words that not only did they cut me down and let me go, but that night I sold them $2,000 worth of Israel bonds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I must just pause for one fast second and say a fast word about oral contraception. I was involved in an extremely good example of oral contraception two weeks ago. I asked a woman to go to bed with me. 
And she said no. <laughs> no more. That's as risque as it gets. Okay, blushing, I can say that. <laughs> you know, I don't know what else to tell you about myself. Um, oh, I know. I do tend to worry too much, I think, about my health. I had once a pain in the chest area. And I was convinced it was heartburn. Because I was at that time still married to my first wife, who was cooking with her Nazi recipes, you know, chicken hemla, <laughs> duck a la Eichmann. <laughs> and I didn't want to pay 25 bucks to have it reaffirmed by some medic that I had heartburn. But I was worried, because it was in the chest of area. Then, it turns out, my friend, Eggs Benedict, <laughs> has a pain in his chest area in the same exact spot. So I figured if I could get eggs to go to the doctor, I could figure out what's wrong with me at no charge. So I con eggs, and he goes. Turns out he's got heartburn. Cost him $25, and I feel great. Because <laughs> I figure I'd beat the medic out of 25 big ones. I call up eggs two days later. He died. <laughs> I check into a hospital immediately, have a battery of tests run, x-rays. Turns out I got heartburn. Cost me $110. <laughs> now I'm furious. I run to Egg's mother, and I say, did he suffer much? And she said, no, was quick. Car hit him, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Strange life, I leave. <laughs> I, um... I was kidnapped once. <laughs> You're laughing? I was standing in front of my schoolyard, and a black sedan pulls up. And two guys get out. And they say to me, do I want to go away with them to a land where everybody's fairies and elves? And I can have all the comic books I want, and chocolate, and wax lips, you know? And I said yes, when I got into the car with them. Because I figured, you know, what the hell? I was home that weekend from college anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and they drive me off, and they send a ransom note to my parents, and my father has bad reading habits. So he gets into bed at night with a ransom note, and he read half of it, you know. And he got drowsy and fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> then he lent it out. <laughs> Meanwhile, they take me to New Jersey, bound and gagged. And my parents finally realize that I'm kidnapped and they snap into action immediately. They rent out my room. <laughs> the ransom note says for my father to leave $1,000 in a hollow tree in New Jersey. He has no trouble raising $1,000, but he gets a hernia carrying the hollow tree. <laughs> <laughs> the FBI surround the house. Throw the kid out, they say. Give us your guns and come out with your hands up. The kidnappers say, we'll throw the kid out, but let us keep our guns and get to our car. <laughs> the FBI says, throw the kid out, we'll let you get to your car, but give us your guns. The kidnappers say, we'll throw the kid out, but let us keep our guns, we don't have to get to our car. <laughs> the FBI says, Keep the kid. <laughs> the FBI decides to lob in tear gas, but they don't have tear gas. So several of the agents put on the death scene from Camille. <laughs> tear stricken, my abductors give themselves up. They're sentenced to 15 years on a chain gang, but they escape. Twelve of them chained together at the end, getting by the guards, Posing as an immense charm bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to um, check how long we have left to receipt. That's my accountant later. <laughs> and also to, uh, mainly to be honest, to flash this watch. I flash it all the time. It's my antique pocket watch. It makes me look jazzy. 
elegant and uh, British, I think. <laughs> Thank you. I used to have my wife's picture in here, but it kept stopping. <laughs> I don't know if you can all see, but it is a gorgeous gold pocket watch. And I'm very proud of it, enormously. It has, actually, seriously, great sentimental value for me. My grandfather, on his deathbed, sold me this watch. <laughs> I did, however, get a very good deal. He was not in the best of health to haggle for very long. You know? My grandfather was a very insignificant man, actually. At his funeral, his hearse followed the other cars. <laughs> it was a very nice funeral, though. You would have liked it. It was a catered funeral. It was held in a big hall with accordion players. And on the buffet table, there was a replica of the deceased in potato salad. <laughs> Beautiful. Which I think brings me to my, uh, my main conclusion here today. And that is that I got married. That's the biggest thing that's happened to me. I got married for the second time, incidentally. I should have known something was wrong with my first wife. When I brought her home to meet my parents, they approved of her. <laughs> But my dog died, is what happened. <laughs> Myself and the first Mrs. Allen got married in Long Island in New York. We were married by a reform rabbi in Long Island. A very reform rabbi. A Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a very nice affair. Oh, except for my father. He squatted down. Did one of those Russian dances, and he tore a leg muscle and froze in that position. I you know, walked down the aisle like that. <laughs> but right after the wedding, my wife started turning weird. She went to Hunter College to study philosophy, and she started dressing in black clothes, and no makeup, and leotards, and she pierced her ears one day with a hole punch. <laughs> She used to involve me in deep philosophical arguments and prove that I did exist. <laughs> was a rough man. My first wife was uh, an immature woman. That's all I can say. But see if this is not immature to you. I would be home in the bathroom taking a bath, and my wife would walk right in whenever she felt like and sink my boats. <laughs> so and we used to argue and fight constantly. Often